Welcome to the MBA on Microsoft Blockchain as a Service. My name is Kale Teeter. Uh, I'm here with my colleague Derek Martin, and I'm going to talk a little bit about myself here. I'm a software development engineer at Microsoft. I've been about 15 years development uh, in software development industry, and I've been working mostly with startups and partners now in the blockchain space. And so I spend most, almost all my time working on that right now, and I want to share some of that knowledge about what Microsoft's building in blockchain as a service and how these kind of work together with what uh, my passions are. Yep, and I'm Derek Martin. I am a cloud solution architect in the Azure space, and it's a pleasure to be here with Kale today. Uh, I've been working with blockchain for about a year and uh, really enjoyed uh, learning from my colleagues, learning uh, out in the industry. Uh, my primary focus is around the infrastructure uh, and how you can get DevOps working within Azure uh, and the blockchain ecosystem as a whole. Uh, really looking forward to the session today and uh, hope you enjoy it. So let's get started. Thanks. So, okay, so for, from an agenda perspective, we have five modules that we're going to go through here. The first module, we're going to talk about some of the core technologies behind blockchain, and that includes distributed ledgers as well as consensus mechanisms um, that allow these blockchains to actually function in the real world. So let's get started with that. So in order to start thinking about blockchains and thinking about how these things actually function, you actually really have to get down to the core and understand what, it, what it makes blockchains up. What are the core components that make these yep. things up? And one of the things is these, these digests or digital signatures. It's one of the core components. And if you look at this slide, we basically are showing on this slide that we have a couple different use cases here. We have a, a user here um, that has a username, a birthday, and a SSN, or social security number. And they have a private key. And then we also have a, a device, let's say in this case it's a phone, uh, that has a serial number and a manufacturer good. And those, that thing also has a key that it's going to be able to use to sign things with. Um, so when I say we do a signing operation, we're actually going to use that key and run a hashing algorithm, which is a one-way hash that allows us to basically then unique, generate a unique digest. And you can think of that unique digest as a public key. So those of you that are familiar with PKI and the different... Uh, like know, PGP and different technologies like that. Exactly. These have been around for 30 plus years. And so when you're thinking about those kind of technologies, it's the exact same technology that we're using here. The primary goal is to be able to generate something publicly that we can share with people, and the only person who could have generated that is the guy who owns the private key. And we have a, another one of our modules here in just a little bit that'll go a little bit deeper into how key management works. But the, one of the really important things to note about this is it's not just people that make up these digests, it's also devices. And so when you start talking about Internet of Things, you start talking about you know, the washing machines and, and different things of the world able to communicate on the, to the blockchain, uh, these devices or people, um, they hold their private key uh, in escrow, and then the public key is what's out there on the on the blockchain for people to verify against. Correct, correct. Okay. So basically, in this in this model, you can see that when we bring those three, we generate unique hashes. Now, keep that in mind as we go to something a little bit more uh, advanced. If we start thinking about, well, we could do that for one device or one human or one object in the world. Uh, one other thing that we could do though is start to combine these. So let's say that um, in this case, we're talking about a phone, and we have a touch screen and maybe some memory that goes into that. There's many components inside a phone, right? And we're getting those from different manufacturers or different sourcers out there. And so each one of those things is unique, right? So when we get that memory chip, there's actually a serial number on it and a good from that manufacturer. Um, Touchscreen is the same way. But then when we start to combine those together, we actually create another unique device, right? Because we're going to ultimately create a phone here, and that phone will have a serial number and some sort of GUID that's going to map to a unique object in the world. Um, so if you think about this, we can generate those hashes just like I showed on that first slide, and then we could take those digests and run those through a hashing algorithm, and then we get another unique hash. And so now what we've done is basically created a unique digest here, or a public key, that if any of those components change for some reason, like if somebody went back and tried to actually change one of the public keys for, let's say, the touchscreen or the memory or any of these different components that are in there, it will break, right? Because it, the calculation won't work out for the second one. So it's not just the person and it's not just the object. In these composite objects, we're talking about the person and their object. So it's Kale and his Microsoft phone equal a composite object that can interact with the blockchain as an independent unit of work. Sure. 
And you can even think about it as a device, just components inside of a device, all those little pieces that make it up. If you think about a car, for instance, it's made up of millions of pieces. When they put that thing together, um, we can actually generate a hash, and we can ultimately get to one hash or, or one public key or digest over the whole car and basically could describe, and you could go back and look at all the hashes that make up every bolt and nut and computer and everything that's in that car. Um, so it's a unique way to kind of start to combine those, and it kind of folds into what is an actual blockchain. Because what we're thinking about with a blockchain is we have a bunch of transactions that we're going to sign, and they're a composite, right? Because right. there's a bunch of those things, and we're going to smash those together and create a, create a unique hash. So once we have our objects, whether it be an individual or a thing, and then the composite object, then how do we get from that point to a block? Right. So when you think about blockchains now, so let's, we talked a little bit abstract there about devices and humans and these things that we could sign with these keys. When we start talking about now really getting into what's a distributed ledger and what's a blockchain, um, the idea here really is that we have transactions that are going to interact with a blockchain. So think of it as a similar to like a database, right? So we're going to make some transactions into that. We're going to do some write operations that's going to come into this thing. When we do those, they don't happen real time. Uh, if you look at this slide, you can see there's three humans here on this slide who are interacting with a blockchain and they're sending transactions in. And they're all different hashes on those transactions. So again, every time you go to put something on the blockchain, a write operation, we're going to use your key and we're going to sign it. Now we know for sure that came from Derek or it came from Kale. We know 100% because he's the only one who has a private key that could have signed that thing. So in the general sense from where people are uh, most familiar, and we'll talk about different types of chains here in a second, but if I was going to uh, buy a Bitcoin or buy an Ether token, uh, I would sign my transaction. That's why it requires you to put in your password each time. That unlocks your private key. That signs the transaction and then sticks it out here onto this chain of blocks, and then those blocks build up over time. Is that Sure, and we'll talk a little bit in a couple slides about how that operation actually functions, but from a high level, yeah, that's exactly right, Derek. We basically are going to collect all these transactions together, and at some point, we need to create a block. Now, there's different ways to do that. If you look at different blockchains like Bitcoin or Ethereum or even some of the proprietary ones, um, that's kind of like where the secret sauce is, right? How do we figure out how big to make that block and the different parameters that we can kind of feed in to make this blockchain work? So tell me a little bit about headers, and so we're looking at this slide here around mm -hmm. chain of blocks. Uh, what makes up a block? We've got a header, we've got some transactions, which is some keys moving around. What, mm -hmm. what goes into play here? Yeah, so the thing to think about here, again, is think about it like this. We took all those transactions that we built up. In this case, on the slide, you can see we have three transactions. So we hash those, and now we're going to write a block with those. So when we go to write that block, we obviously have a header now. If it's the genesis block or the first block on the blockchain, uh, we already have that header in there. Um, and basically what we're going to do now is pack our transactions into there. So we're going to have a list of all these transactions we have in there. We're going to have our hash. And that's going to form what's called a Merkle tree. Mm -hmm. So the Merkle tree is basically saying, okay, now we've got this one block up here. Now when the second block is created, as you can see on this slide, he's going to take the header from the first block and he's going to take the transactions. That's what he's going to use to build his hash. Now you can understand that we have a hard link between these. Nobody can change that history now. If somebody tried to tamper with block one, it'll break the chain because it won't work now. Block two will say, no, that doesn't match with what I have. And so you can think about something as, as big and complex as Bitcoin now has been out since 2011. And all of those blocks since the very first, the Genesis block, are mathematically linked in this Merkle tree mm -hmm. that go all the way back. And so you can verify and validate that no transaction has been forged. Uh, nothing has been removed, and it really builds this immutable ledger that, uh, that we're talking about here. And so uh, let's talk a little bit about how these different types of blockchains work. I've, I've been using Bitcoin as a good example, but there are others as well. Yeah, we could talk a little bit about uh, two different types. These are, so let's talk about from the public sense, and then we can talk a little bit yeah. from the private side. Um, so from the public sense, like, like Derek had mentioned, I think it was 2009, Bitcoin had come out. Ethereum is relatively young. I mean, it was last year around this time, mm -hmm. around November, that uh, that came out. But essentially, they're two different models. Um, they're both using blockchain technology. So the, the concepts that we just talked about with how chains actually get created, very similar between these two. When you talk about Bitcoin, you're talking about what's called UTXO, or unspent transaction output. And we'll talk about what that means in the next slide and how that kind of functions. But really, think about it as a way to cal calculate your balance. Bitcoin was really created around a way for you to trade assets, essentially. Right. Um, 
there, there's a block inside of there, so there's basically an 80 byte uh, chunk at the end of these blocks that you write in a Bitcoin blockchain that allows you to kind of pack some other stuff in there, some data. And that's where people have leveraged it to do other things with Bitcoin. Right. Um, so if you look at the core, you don't really need to do a lot with that. Like Derek mentioned, you can sign a transaction that say, I want to take some unspent transaction output and transfer it to Derek, I, I as myself. And we can make that transaction actually happen through the consensus algorithm that's built into Bitcoin. Um, but if we want to do something more advanced and have scripts and different things like that, we'll talk about in some of our later slide decks, um, there is some features to, to enable You have that 80-byte window yeah. to yeah. work with in each block. C compare that or contrast that to Ethereum, which it takes some of the great things about Bitcoin and evolves that into a, a what, what we call a smart contract world where things are slightly more advanced and you have the ability as a first class citizen, instead of working it into that 80 byte uh, footer of the block, uh, the concept inside of a smart contract is it is a computational device. It is intended to execute or store uh, state. So it's more than just sending tokens or assets or money back and forth, you're actually going to be doing uh, some more advanced things. And I think that's what we're going to talk about with Ethereum. Yeah. So the thing to think about there, like Derek had mentioned, is, uh, you know, if you think about these Bitcoin or these blockchains, Bitcoin was really like 1.0, right? He was, this was kind of the first huge, and actually it's one of the biggest blockchains on the planet. And then Ethereum came out, uh, you know, relatively young, like I said, and, and like Derek mentioned, it doesn't just do pure state. So we think of it as kind of 2.0 on blockchain. And really what that means is we can have code that we can inject into there. So if you think about some of the technologies even inside Microsoft over the years, we did code signing and different ways for us to kind of validate and say, when I execute this piece of code, how do I know 100% sure that it came from this, this vendor? It right. came from Microsoft or it came from Derek. How do I know for 100% sure? And the way we did that in the past was we signed it using a CA and mm -hmm. a certificate, and there's a bunch of infrastructure to orchestrate that. This technology allows you to do something very similar. So we can build what's called smart contracts, which are basically executable pieces of code that allow us to store state on the blockchain, as well as interact with other things on the blockchain. So we can interact with other smart contracts. We can interact with other state. Um, so we can do things kind of inside of there. Now, there is some walls around this. Yeah. Um, in order to facilitate the immutability aspect and making sure that uh, people can't compromise the system and that it's totally deterministic. Yeah, and in, in the intervening modules, we're going to talk about some of the pros and cons of each of these two primary uh, blockchains. There are certainly others. Uh, this whole idea of a consensus or a distributed ledger has gained a lot of traction in the marketplace, uh, and there are all manner of different technologies being uh, invented that uh, take from both blocks, uh, both from uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And so it's really neat to see what other kinds of, of chains are coming up, uh, up and coming here in the world. But what we want to do now is kind of dive in and talk a little bit about uh, the details around what is a UTXO versus what is a, uh, what is an Ethereum smart contract. Sure. Yeah, so if we talk about UTXO that I was mentioning before, and this is primarily on Bitcoin blockchain, um, you can take a look at this, and basically what you can see is we have different transactions that are going to function through here. So if you look at my slide here, we basically have transaction zero happening here where we had some input, and then we had two outputs as a result of that. Maybe we already had some value in this chain, right? So we're saying, okay, I have some value here, and I want to transfer it to, in two different transactions. Maybe I'm going to send some, some Bitcoin to Derek, and I'm going to send some Bitcoin to somebody else. And so you can see those outputs actually go as inputs into the next transaction. So in transaction one, now that becomes an input for that. And you basically are building this chain of what are the transactions that are happening in here. If you think about it from like an accounting sense, essentially we kind of have to walk this whole kind of tree to figure out like what's, what's your balance. My, exactly. What is my balance on this chain? So if I want, if he wanted to send half a Bitcoin to me and half a Bitcoin to someone else, those are two different transactions. They get wrapped into, uh, into a block and then whatever's left in your balance gets carried forward as an input to the next block. Correct, correct. And that's, it's kind of like baked into the system, not kind of like, it actually is part of the system to enforce that uh, integrity of saying we can only use unspent output. Because the idea here is to avoid the double spend. And that was one of Bitcoin's big drivers when they first came out with this. You can think of when you're talking about distributed databases, which is really what we're talking about with blockchain, this distributed model of computing, what's the challenge you have there? Well, you're going to have competing transactions, right? Because we don't know where the transactions are coming in from. They're coming in from all these different nodes 
how do we co coordinate that? Like a distributed transaction coordinator almost. Right. How do we handle that and make sure that we don't uh, double spend? So if Derek has five Bitcoins and he transfers three to me and two to someone else and then takes that same three and transfers it to somebody, another party, well, that can't work, right? Because yeah. it's not going to add up. And so this is the model for avoiding that double spend. This is one of the ways that they're kind of baked that into Bitcoin. And I would love to have five Bitcoin at this point. Uh, contrast that to uh, smart contracts in Ethereum. Uh, as we talk about uh, the, the transactions and the hashes from Bitcoin, in the Ethereum ecosystem, you have this, no, this concept of a smart contract. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I have a diagram here to kind of show this one. And again, you can see our blockchain represented on the right side here with all these different nodes. And essentially, somebody's going to come along and create a smart contract at some point. When they create that, they're basically going to, again, we're going to compile it on the, on the machine. So whenever they're building it, they have to compile it, make sure that it meets all the standards for whichever language they're using, Solidity, right. Serpent. There's a bunch of different languages out there. And once they compile it and everything's good, we'll go ahead and sign that thing. And again, now we've signed it. So now we have a signature that says, Derek created this thing or Kale created this thing. And then we can basically submit that transaction, just like anything, into the blockchain. And when we submit that into the blockchain, it will eventually get processed as a transaction, and then it gets an address. And so now we have the address that allows us to interact with that thing. So is it a composite object itself, or is it its own special thing? It's, it's kind of like a special thing up there, okay. right? So you can think about it as an object that now lives on the blockchain, and it gets an address, right? Okay. And when I say address, it's just like a hexadecimal address. It's kind of ugly to look at. But basically what that means is now we have what's basically an interface to talk to that. If you think about in web services world, what do we do? We usually publish some code out there, mm -hmm. and then we tell people either through Swagger or through some other tool, this is how you use it. This is the interface. This is what parameters you got to pass in. Here's what methods you have up there that you can use, whatnot. This is the same thing. So we have what's called ABI file that gets generated if we're using Solidity. And that creates this interface that allows people to talk to the blockchain. So what would happen is Derek would say, hey, I published a contract, Kale, and it's at this address. And the ABI is here, and you can go get the ABI, and you can say, oh, okay, I know how to interact with that thing now. I know what yeah, methods it's kind of like the it's kind of like the header. And inside that smart contract address, you're going to have a list of functions that you can execute on. And there are two different kinds of functions. You've got a read and then a write. Uh, reading is typically doesn't require Ether, and we'll talk about how uh, the financials of the Ethereum ecosystem work here in, in future modules. But you can read from uh, the state of the blockchain, and you can also write to the state by executing a smart contract, whether you're going to order a pizza or uh, sign an insurance policy or whatever the smart contract is there uh, designed to do. Uh, that's how you'll interact with it. Uh, and it looks very much like a web service call. Yeah, it's important to note what Derek had mentioned there about uh, the write versus read. So when we're talking about uh, a, a, just a pure read operation on the blockchain itself, so go get all the nodes or get all the blocks in the blockchain and pull it down to my local client, doesn't cost anything from a sense, and we'll talk about what costing means here, like from an Ether perspective or, or Bitcoin. When you interact with these databases and you actually want to do write operations, you actually have to pay for that, right? There's a, because these were built in a public space, right. um, these are really funded by people who are using the system, right? So in order for you to execute something up there, you actually have to give us some value. Otherwise, you could just compromise the whole system and take over everything. But that also speaks to the real power of a blockchain ecosystem because you have an incentive for hundreds or thousands of different people to run their own node on the Bitcoin or Ethereum ecosystem, they get some value by providing compute power, but they also uh, provide the capability to secure that blockchain because the more nodes you have, uh, it doesn't scale perfectly linearly, but the more nodes that you have, the more secure it is because you reduce the probability that someone can impact 50% or 51% of all of the nodes and cause something else to happen like steal all their ether or execute this contract a million times, uh, that becomes less and less of a priority. And we'll talk about some of the design principles when you want to write your own smart contract, uh, things to think about here in, in the future. But you had mentioned something about you know, these nodes and they, they have this value. They're also doing something called mining. And yep. how does that work? Yeah, so in the, in the current space in blockchain world right now, uh, mining is very big. I mean, this is, it's called proof of work, so you might hear that term thrown around. And really what the idea is, if you look at this slide, we basically have our blockchain laid out here. And this could be, this is Bitcoin or Ethereum, it uh, doesn't really matter. Um, they're both using proof of work right now. Slightly different implementations, but the same model. And essentially what happens here is, 
we have, as Derek mentioned, anybody in the world can come along and, and say, I want to put a node on this network. So right now, you could just go out and say, I want to stand up a Bitcoin node. Or I want to put myself in the public Ethereum space, and I want to create a node out there. And you could totally do that. So you pull down all the blocks. Now you, you're in sync with whatever the current fork is on, on Ethereum, and you're, you're processing, you could process transactions. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say you could process transactions, what's the incentive for you to put a node up there? Other than you saying, wow, this is really cool tech. I would like to see this work. Well, no, that's not real, right? In the real world, people actually want some incentive and money talks here a bit, you know, yeah. especially in the public sense. So you have to pay for that computer. It costs thousands of dollars for you to build that thing and put it online. And so when you say, I want to devote a node up here, you actually want to get something back out of it. So the incentive model that was originally created here was called mining or proof of work. What happens is, we mentioned before that these transactions are going to power up, and at some point we need to write a block. Now, who gets to write the block? What we do is say, basically, whoever gets to write this block is going to get some money uh, in the form of either Bitcoin or Ether in, mm -hmm. in the space that we're talking about here. So you'll get a percentage, and it's actually pretty big. You know, when you talk about Bitcoin or even Ether, you're actually going to make some money here. So what we say is we have to give you basically a really hard problem to solve. So we're going to give you a problem that's basically a hashing function that's going to require a tremendous amount of CPU uh, in order for you to figure this thing out. And it's, the algorithm is set up in such a way that it's really hard to find the answer to this, um, what, what math problem we're going to give you, but it's really easy to validate it. That's right. So that's the special property about this math that's involved here. So what happens is we say, okay, here's the challenge, guys, go do it. And all these nodes are now going to spring into action and try to do that thing. So they're over here grinding CPU, trying to figure out the answer to this thing. And then once they do figure it out, say, hey, I got the right answer. Then everybody stops for a second and says, okay, validate that. Kale says he's got the right answer. And if they validate it and they agree that Kale gave, gave the right answer, which they can do very quickly, mm -hmm. they don't have to do the same function again. They can just check the answer. Then they'll say, okay, yeah, he wins. Okay, he gets it. And each of these different algorithms, whether it be um, Bitcoin or Ethereum or one of the other uh, blockchain technologies out there, that algorithm or that, that uh, computation is optimized for one or more different types of hardware. So in the Bitcoin world, uh, it's primarily optimized for ACE hardware, so these things just spit out hashes left and right, hundreds of thousands of them per second. Uh, there are other t blockchains that are uh, optimized to speak to GPU compute. Some are CPU bound. Uh, and so it's really kind of up to the development organization of that particular blockchain to figure out what type of equipment is going to be best incented to provide that. And that speaks to the scalability. It speaks to uh, the community and what type of controls they want to have around that. Uh, but those are just some of the more esoteric things that go along behind the scenes. So real quick, before we wrap up this module, can we compare and, and contrast the two together real quick? Yeah, I think one more thing just to inject there on the mining piece. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier about like we have these public chains and then we have private ones. And we haven't talked too much about private ones. We'll definitely be digging into those in the different modules. Uh, because that's really the value that enterprises are seeing with the blockchain. Right. Uh, I don't think that the, the financial industry, obviously there's a financial side to cryptocurrency, which is Bitcoin and Ether. The token itself, the asset. Yeah, exactly. So there's a whole market built around that, and that's a whole kind of separate space. But there's also this space to say, hey, could we use the same technology inside an enterprise wall to do the same aspects that we're looking for? And the key aspects are these really strong security mechanisms right. with the keys, uh, the immutability aspect, being able to not be able to change it, this provides tremendous value in the auditing perspective. So if we want to do real-time audits, we can actually do that now and prove to an auditor that we didn't change it. Right. This is impossible to change it based on the math. Um, and the other aspect being a shared database. You know, this thing being essentially from a logical perspective, one big database that everybody's right. writing into if you think about it from that sense. Now, obviously, there's a lot of restrictions around what yeah, we some do. Some downsides, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we'll talk through that. But I just wanted, I wanted to draw the corollary. And one of the things is mining that comes up. And mining is, you know, there's a lot of carbon footprint there, you can imagine, because uh, as Derek mentioned, there's specialized hardware. It's very expensive. It uses a lot of electricity to run. So these kind of things, when enterprises think about it, they say, why do I need to do that? Like, why would I issue challenges, even if I'm doing working with Derek? Maybe we're two businesses working mm -hmm. together. Um, there's other algorithms that are being built, and actually some are out there right now in proprietary form. But um, you know, if you look at some of the stuff that Ethereum's working on with Casper or Proof of Stake, 
there's different proofs that are coming out to be able to do those kind of operations so that we don't have to do this heavy carbon footprint mining. Heavy carbon footprint, yeah. massive, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of nodes to require uh, require to make it secure, those kinds of things. And, and again, we'll talk more about those uh, pros and cons in a future module, in a future module here. Uh, but I think to, to wrap up, uh, just take a look at this uh, last slide here where we're, we're kind of comparing uh, and contrasting the, the different types of Bitcoin uh, or the different types of uh, transactions. Uh, between a traditional one uh, in a database world where maybe you've got a, a SQL always on availability group, uh, where you've got two databases that are needing to be in sync, and so they are sending their transaction logs back and forth. Uh, in, a, in a blockchain world, uh, every node that participates in that chain has a copy of that distributed database or that distributed ledger, and they all have to stay in sync. And there are pros and cons, again, like we had talked about around how those things work. But uh, it's important to know that, uh, and I think probably the biggest thing to know if you're going to be developing against a blockchain ecosystem is that, yes, it's asynchronous, just like some of the traditional databases can be, but that asynchronicity can be measured in tens of seconds, not milliseconds, because uh, that state has to be gathered from around the different net nodes in the network. Yeah, and I think the thing to take, to take away from this slide is really think about a distributed database versus a decentralized database. Big difference between the Big two. Big difference, yeah. So if we said in a traditional sense, we say how when we're going to create a database where we're going to fan it out, right? We're going to span this thing out uh, in a distributed fashion. We can do that today, right, with clusters. But the, the, there's inherent trust there between those nodes. Like we very, very tightly like know what those nodes are doing. So if Derek is a business and I'm a business, we're two separate businesses, but we want to work together. In order for us to, we couldn't set up, if I set up a SQL cluster, let's say, for instance, on a SQL server, and I said, Derek, you're going to put my, a node, yeah. you know, there's got to be some really tight trust between I don't want to let yeah. you on my domain to run the SQL, uh, SQL environment, whereas in a Bitcoin, or excuse me, a blockchain uh, infrastructure, um, I don't necessarily have to trust you. Right, and that's a, there's a huge point there, and we'll kind of hit this as these modules go on, of being totally trustless, which is like the Bitcoin, Ethereum world, and partially trusted, which is these private chains, where we're basically going to have different nodes. So we have different admin groups. Right. Derek has his admins, I have my admins, and we're going to work together. We're going to build nodes, but they're all going to talk together. So we can still manage it the way we want to manage it. Derek can manage it the way he wants to manage it. And we're going to come to a consensus around what the state of this data should be. Right. You know. Yeah, and we'll talk some more about those in the upcoming modules. Uh, for now, we'll close out this module. Thank you guys so much for watching, and we'll see you here in just a little bit. Thanks, guys.